Hey everybody, welcome to, oh, I'm going to start this again. We're starting both shows at the same time, the iTunes show and the Facebook Live show. And just give us one second, we're starting. Hey everybody, welcome to Should I Love with Lily. Say your last name so I don't say it wrong. Marie. Marie, because yes. I've been pronouncing it Marie all this time and actually spelling it wrong. Uh, oh, really? Yes, well, until I realized on I, Facebook, because <laughs> Facebook tells you everything is the God to everything. Yes, it is. Yes. I'm so excited uh, to have you on the show. I've known you such a long time. I know. And we've been friends. I and we know. know each other personally, but we yes. really didn't know each other business-wise very no. well. No, so this is really I mean, I've been a big cheerleader and a big fan of yours for a long time, too. Really? Oh, God. Well, I had no idea. First of all, I think you're really funny. Oh, and well, thank then, you. um, you know, I just thought I was so excited with Birth of a Nation and you it were was getting... an incredible, incredible uh, experience. Oh, yeah. And you that know. you were getting the, you know, the notice that you should. Oh, so. That's so extraordinarily sweet and kind. So, this is our poster. And it's all backwards. And if anybody knows how to figure it out, how to how to get it the other way, please let me know. Uh, Lily, to me, you are the episodic queen. Oh gosh! I mean, it just I mean, first I want to start about ER. Okay. So I think it's really interesting mm -hmm. the whole idea of having almost two sets of casts in yes. a sense well, of EA because you have all the stars that are regulars yes. on the show that, oh, right. that are all the people that uh, work out and don't mm -hmm. and the girls that don't eat with the big boobs <laughs> am I right it's like all those people that well, are on the show basically that are stars you know that are basically how do you say this without sounding weird it's their character actors mm -hmm. who have a different kind of beauty, I believe. Mm. And then they're the kind of people in the business that they feel are attractive. Then they are selling this idea of this kind of beauty, mm -hmm. whether it be Julianne Margulies, who hasn't had anything to eat since, I think, 1973, or George Clooney, who's just gorgeous. Yeah. Who I got to work with. Oh, you did? I work with him on a show called Sunset Beat with Patrick Hasberg. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Every time he sees me, he's very nice. But anyway. Yes, he is very nice. That's very sweet. And, uh, but how did, so how did you get that job at first? I'm so curious. Uh, well, I had worked with, uh, John Wells and Mimi Leader on an episode of China Beach. Oh, wow. And, uh, John Levy, the casting director, had brought me, you know, over the he years. He scares me a little. Does he? He's always he's not, so, he, do you don't find him not, a little scary? A little I ominous? See, I can see why people think he's scary, he but just scares I've me. never been I've never felt him. comfortable in his office. Really? I've always felt sort of like... Uh, what am I doing here? <laughs> well, he does have a big personality, but I just feel like that. he has an even bigger heart. So does he really? When you get to know him, it's like oh, okay. I don't think I've gotten That's past awesome. the scary yet. Oh, you know, I think if you just decide he's not scary when you go in, he's not scary. I did decide, and then I walked in, and he was scary. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyways, John just you know brought me in for like a million things, and you know some of them I got, and some of them I didn't. And then he brought me in to audition for ER, and I, the pilot had shown, and everybody knew it was a big deal, and so I was a little nervous. And were you in the pilot? Uh, no, no, I was not. Um, I was came in on episode four of the first season, and um, what did you play? I played a nurse. I Just played a, nurse. a nurse. Yeah. Played, my name was Lily Jarvik. Was it a coincidence, or did they call? Uh, no, they called me Lily Jarvik on purpose. Uh -huh. uh, well, they called me Lily. Um, they asked me if they could call me Lily. I said yes, of course. And um, I probably would have said no. <laughs> I said, please just give me a name. I don't want to be. You well, know. I only I thought it was only going to be on one episode. So of course. I thought, you know, okay, well, call me whatever you want. Just spell my name right on the check, right? Yes, so, exactly. So I thought it was just one episode, and. Um, uh, and then it turned into another, and then it turned into another, and then I ended up doing 127 episodes over 15 seasons. What is that like? I mean, just, that's my fantasy. Is it? it oh my God, to be on a series and to feel comfortable, and you go in and you just feel like you have oh, a job. I remember when yeah. I was on My Wife and Kids, they gave us a parking spot. I had a recurring role. Uh -huh. And they gave us that little pass because I was on my third episode. Oh. I only did four. But on my third episode, they gave me a pass and it said my name on it. I actually went to the bathroom and I started to cry. Aww. I was so completely... It's, um, it's exciting. I mean, it really is very exciting to be to be on a show where, you know, I mean, it, it got to the point where we got ourselves into hair and makeup, we got ourselves a wardrobe, we got ourselves a set, you know, and there'd be the DGA trainee coming in and, 
you know, the new one. And like, I remember for one... For those who are not oh. in show business, DJ is Directors Guild of America. So that's yes. the person who comes on who wants to be a director, who shadows the television directors. And doing episodic TV is very different than doing films. Yes. Well, in this case, the trainee's job was sort of the sort of outside set PA. Mm -hmm. And so that person's job was to make sure we were in hair and makeup when we were supposed to be, and we were in costume when we were supposed to be, and on the set when we were supposed to be. So, you know, we were all just so used to getting ourselves to where we needed to be. Of course. That, you know, I get there, go to hair and makeup, and I can hear on the the walkie-talkie. Okay. I don't know where Lily is. I've looked at her trailer. I've looked all around. I can't find her. And somebody said, she's right here. <laughs> and then somebody said, she's right here in hair and makeup. Oh, okay. So then I put my wardrobe on and I go onto the set and I'm sitting there and then I can hear over the walkie-talkie, I can't find Lily. <laughs> I checked the trailer and I checked hair and makeup and I don't know where she is. <laughs> and finally the first AD said, you know what? You don't have to follow these guys around. They've been here forever. They've been here forever, and they know what to do, and they'll be on the set when they're supposed to so be. So let me ask a question. So there's, there's first, I know Ellen Crawford also. You do. I, just adore. I love Ellen. And you know my friend Terry Ray. You work with him yes, in, a in a play. So hello, Terry, if you're Hi, listening. Terry. And uh, what's really cool about all this is you get, you just, oh God, I just messed up something because I'm trying to do so many things at the same time with <laughs> Facebook. So you get to work, mm -hmm. you know, all the time. You mm -hmm. get this incredible amount of experience. Mm -hmm that you would actually get. Right. And I think it's just, you wouldn't exactly get by working on ER. You get this incredible experience. Just for those who just tuned in, we have uh, Lily, say your last name. Marie. Marie here on Should I Love, my new podcast. Uh, on, uh, it's going to be on iTunes and Spotify and all these great things. And now we're on Facebook Live, so we're on both. And uh, Lily is a wonderful actor and director, and I have her on the show. And we're talking about her experiences on ER. Mm -hmm. So you didn't really know that it was going to be a recurring role. Did you have a contract? Um, no, we just we went. I went to episode by episode. You know, we always we had, the whole time. Yeah, I mean, we did have a chance to to do that, but that would have limited us from doing other things and. John was always very generous about letting me go and guest star on other shows or movies, you know, act on movies. And then when I started directing, um, I would take my film to film festivals. And so that was easier for me to just take an episode off and go to London or whatever to attend my film festival. Wow. So they would just give the, say, hey, Ellen, you're going to be doing Lily's part. Or if whatever. They, or yeah, Lily, right. Lily, you're going to be doing Ellen's part. So they would just, they would have a series, a bunch of nurses or whoever was available. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'd be together mm -hmm. and sometimes you wouldn't. Yes. And what's really interesting is about the, the nurses and the orderlies and all the people mm -hmm. that, that worked in the hospital, the other doctors that were not, I guess, didn't have as big as parts. Right. It, there's a part of that that I found, I don't know how to say it, it's just, it's like saying... It's like if you're not this kind of Hollywood beauty, mm -hmm. you don't get paid as less. You don't get to have a series regular job. And I would watch that and I thought about that and it really started to bother me for a while because I would watch you guys. Oh. You know, and I'd look mm -hmm. at how well everybody saying, did their job and how mm -hmm. incredible it's saying mm -hmm. and thinking to myself, why aren't those people moved up? Why aren't they becoming the regulars on the show instead of bringing in new young people with mm -hmm. pert boobs mm -hmm. and workout abs you know always it's like when I first saw Grey's Anatomy I loved the show and then mm -hmm. as the years have gone on it's now about pretty people mm -hmm. and the character actors are gone mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. did there was there ever a feeling like that it's an odd question to ask but I'm always curious is there ever a feeling like second tier like we're not you know people uh, ever want to move up and become regulars was there ever talk of that I mean I think maybe on other shows where there is a division I mean, I, you know, now that I'm directing, I don't really even see that division on other shows. But that's you also. I know you, and you're that kind of person. Do you know what I mean? I don't think you would ever create a division. Right. You know what I mean? But, I mean, when you go onto a new show, you know, you can you feel the lay of the land pretty quickly. And you can tell if, you know, some people get treated differently than some people. And the shows I've been on, they've been, it's been pretty equal and uh, you know the thing with ER is that there were so many huge scenes where all of us were in it and and it was a you know there were a lot of steady cam shots where it was all one take 
So if there's a weak link in the room, and it could be George, it could be me, if somebody messes up their line, we all have to start over again. Oh, that's such pressure. Did that ever happen to so, you? So, that I messed up? Yeah. No. Really? No. Never? Not on a not on a one or Oh my god. No. Um Did you always have a lot of really long lines to say like the oh, doctor sure. doctor lines? Yeah. And how oh, did sure. you, oh god, was it hard to learn at first or uh it was. That first year, you know, we were working some days, eighteen hour days. And we used to go in on weekends to learn, you know, because we were actors. We didn't know how to hold instruments. We're holding them like pencils, you know. We didn't mm. know what we were doing, we didn't know how to pronounce anything. We didn't know what was wrong with the patient. We didn't know what we were doing to the patient. We didn't know what was going to happen to the patient. So we'd go in on weekends, first of all, to learn pronunciation. Because if you pronounce something, if you learn when you're memorizing your lines, if you learn to pronounce it incorrectly and you're going that fast, uh, there's no way you're going to relearn it. No. So you have to learn it right the first time. And then we learned what we were doing to the patient and, and what was wrong with the patient. So you and, do that every sort week? Of that you were on the show? Well, at first, in the first year. And then you have to learn the level of intensity. Is this patient going to die? Is this patient going to be okay? You know, are we worried about our lunch break? You know what I mean? So there was a, it was sort of like doing Shakespeare where you, you don't really, you know, or, or, or speaking in a foreign language that you don't know. So you're learning these words, but you have to like have this intent behind it. Mm -hmm, of course. Of, like you this know what guy, you're talking about. Like well, also, but also, you know, the camera's looking at, and the good directors would focus on, on you know, the supporting cast to sort of figure out what we were supposed to feel. Am I supposed to feel nervous because this guy's going to die? And that's why when you look at me, it's like if I don't seem concerned, then the audience relaxes. Oh, okay. This guy's going to be all right. So then it tends to be seen that this is a real emergency or this is right. something funny or is this is something... Right. Is this something funny? He's got like a, you know... A pin sticking in his head. You yeah, know? whatever. You know, and he's going to be fine and we don't really... Just, it's like oh, get him through and get him upstairs, you know? Or is this person on the edge of dying? Mm -hmm. And is this dire? And so, you know, the shots of, of, all, of all of us, but I think mainly supporting cast, sort of tells the audience... This is how you're supposed to feel. Did anybody ever want to move up and sort of fight for that on the show from your group to the next group? Um, and then they were gotten rid of or stayed on and just sort of went back to where they were. Anybody ever try to do that? Uh, yes, but I can't really no, talk I, about no, of course. <laughs> well, because I would think, you know, that people, everybody wants to have a series, but yours mm -hmm. is sort of an unusual thing. Because right. there are not a lot of shows that have a st second string of supporting actors mm -hmm. that are on there all the time. And now, how many? A hundred and what episodes? Twenty-seven. One hundred twenty-seven episodes. And, and what other episodes did you do as an actress that you just loved? Um, well, gosh, I did. I did a lot. I recurred uh, as a werewolf on Teen Wolf for one season, <laughs> which was awesome. Um, Tell me about it. Uh, it was great, you know. I I got to, I, I got to be a werewolf, you know. I mean, th there's some things that you, as an actor, just assume that you're never gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm never gonna be a werewolf. Right, I'm never gonna be a werewolf. And the fact that I was a werewolf, um, you know, it was it was pretty amazing. Um, what was it like? What was it like to work on One Mississippi with uh, Tig Notaro? I know Tig. We worked oh, together did? on the road a number of times. It was great. She was she town. was awesome. That's an, a different tone show. It's a really. It was it was. I was supposed to be her doctor, so I'm like palpating her, you know, for her um, exam. But then she has this fantasy in the middle of the exam. That you know, I I tell her that the cancer's back, and then this parade goes through the room, and it's it's just kind of crazy. So it's this combination of comedy and drama at the same yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. She Who was directed great. your episode? Uh, uh, was it Nicole Hassafa Bethada? <laughs> I never can say her name. No, it was Shira Piven. Oh, okay. Because yeah, a lot of women directors now. Mm -hmm. So um, a number of years ago, you directed your own film. Mm -hmm. Which was called, I guess. Um, was well, it I started with I start with my first shorts. my first film was a short. Yes, uh, the Shangri La Cafe, and uh -huh. um, I started directing because of VR. 
I really I saw one of the other actors sitting at Video Village, which is where the, all the monitors are. The director looks and watches what's going on. And I saw one of our actors in street clothes with headphones on watching. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm shadowing. I said, what's shadowing? Because I didn't know. He goes, I'm learning how to be a director. I said, really? Well, I, I want to learn how to be a director. I'm sitting here 16 hours a day. Might as well do something. Uh, yeah, I want to do that too. So I asked John Wells and he, he said, of course, um, let me figure out who you can shadow. Wow, just like that. Yeah. How long had you been on the show? Uh, three or four years by then. Wow. And uh, so he he asked Leslie Linka Gladder, who's now like the queen of directing, mm -hmm. if I could shadow her. And she said yes. And so I shadowed her on like four or five episodes of ER. I shadowed Jonathan Kaplan on What ER. did you learn by shadowing that you hadn't known as an actor before? Um, the process. You know, the that there's it's not just shooting the episode, it's the prep you have to do. Do you to, enjoy the prep? I love the prep. I Which is setting the up the shots, working with a DP. Well, no, prep is uh figuring out locations, figuring out Oh the so the the, the line producer doesn't do that. The director picks the location. Oh, well, even, even the hired, because on an episodic, for those of you who don't know, the epi a director is a hired hand in the same way that an actor who guest stars on the show, yes. unless you're one of the producers, and a lot of shows, episodic shows, have a producer. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll t let me tell you what I do. Go ahead. I get the script, and then I start figuring out what my locations might be. I make a shot list, which informs the crew um, where I want to put the camera and w what kind of shots I need, close-ups, wide shots, w what exactly I want. And then um, I have to figure out, uh, I also have to, f I have m meetings all day. So I have meetings with wardrobe to figure out what the, our characters are going to wear. I have meetings with the um, production designer. Uh, for instance, I just did NCAS LA and we had to design a, like a back room to a, a, a little store. Mm -hmm. and, and I also had to design a little house. Oh, so, really? That I blew up. So, that you blew up? That I blew up. So I had to help them, I had to show them what I wanted. This is the blocking. I Even as a guest director, I didn't oh, realize it was absolutely. so... Absolutely. And, and this is the blocking I want. And so then he, he and I, because he brought me a design of a little room, and I was like, no, because I need the back room over here, and I need the desk over here, and I need the door here, so when this person comes in, she sees these two people. Oh my right God, I've worked with so many unprepared directors, <laughs> and especially then, in independent films. Then um, I have meetings with the art department, and we talk about what does the room look like? For instance, in Chicago PD, there was a shot of this little boy's room. He'd been kidnapped. And I noticed that in the script, uh, he got kidnapped after a music lesson. And so I said, all right, so in the room, let's put a musical instrument with a, exactly. with like a, um, you know, music stand and some music. And, you know, my husband plays a saxophone. So I said, if you find a saxophone in the prop room, let's use that. Um, and then I have uh, meetings with casting, of course. So we figure out what I want the guest stars to look like, how old, what, you know, do we open it up, up to all ethnicities, which I always do. Do that, you find that they give you a hard time with that ever? No. Or how about age or whether no. the person is better looking or not? Uh, Looks? Because on a lot of those shows you're talking about, mm -hmm. I call them hair and makeup shows. Mm. The stars are usually very pretty people mm -hmm. and there's certain shows that are more like well Mississippi is more of a character actor show mm -hmm. and you know like Teen Wolf is more of a good looking show mm -hmm. and everybody each show has its own little personality mm -hmm. like if you do a period piece they decide what kind of person looks good in this period because they basically I think in a lot of television mimics old movies because mm -hmm. they don't really mimic real life because mm -hmm. there were bald people in real life yes <laughs> yes <laughs> or there were women who were, you know, there were black people and Asian people in real life. They were right. around. <laughs> right. They just suddenly didn't uh, disappear. They just weren't in movies and television. As well, much. I mean, I think it's up to the director to ask, you know, to say, let's bring in um, all ethnicities. 
And so the casting director, a good casting director, director will bring you a wide range of people. And, um, you know, you decide the casting with the producers. Yeah. But the director always has a lot of input about it. You know, I mean, at a certain point, it's sort of like, they want this person, okay. It's their show. Yeah. It's their show. Yeah. But, you know, you definitely have but a lot of input. But in your three cents, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, the way I would usually find it's usually... Uh, you know, there's probably four or five people, right? Producers and director and casting director, mm -hmm. and they usually, you know, three say yes and two say no, so they, the three go, go. Isn't that usually the way it happens? Out of, uh, out of well, plan? or is there someone who the showrunner gets to decide more? Usually, in the casting room, when we're after you, the actors leave, it's the casting director, the producer, and I. Mm -hmm. um, the showrunner's usually busy. You know, with the overview of oh, okay. the entire show. So the showrunner is usually not in the room with us. Um, the showrunner, you know, what you do is you send them, you know, sort of your top three picks. You don't just get, you don't just say, "I want Jason Stewart for this part." You say, "I want Jason Stewart, blah 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 blah," and then you send that to the showrunner. He or she looks at it, and then of course the network has to approve. Oh wow. So you just send the people that you want and then So let's talk about the network. So how do how do you have to deal with them? How do they what is, what is their usual makeup of this? Is it anything usual or are they all different? Once depending on which network person you deal with, is mm -hmm. there a usual of the kind of show is it the kind of show or is it a different kind of is each person do you find them individual or is there sort of a theme of the way they pick actors for the show? Um uh, I or is it all different? It's I guess it's all different. Yeah, because I was you know I mean, they're, they're forty usually, years an actor. I still don't know so many of these things. <clears throat> I mean, they're it's usually by the time inside. we've looked at it, and by the time the showrunners looked at it, unless the network has some you know real problem with who we've chosen, they're usually pretty good about okay, sure, you mm -hmm. know, because they want us to be happy. Right. Oh yeah, that's nice. That's really nice. And you started directing episodics around two years ago? Uh, three years ago. Three years ago. So yeah. I, when I started directing, I um, it was from, I've shadowed 23 episodes of television. Wow. So from beginning to end. So it's not just the prep, it's not just the Oh wait, shooting. 23 different... So I've shadowed ER like six times. I shadowed West Wing, Gilmore Girls, Homeland... The night shift. I shouted national. Oh, wait, wait, wait. the night visit. shift. Oh my God, that that was that must have been wonderful. Yes, that, that was, was a whole different thing. Of a medical show. Oh, well, I, I, it's just a different kind of tone. That show. I mean, mm. it really had a different tone. Mm -hmm. It was very dark, and it wasn't dialogue driven. It was more story driven and more character driven mm -hmm. than most. Mm -hmm. What did you enjoy working with that on that show? Oh, sure. Who sure. was the star that was? Am I thinking right? Is it John Turturro or is it? I'm thinking, uh, well, that's no. the night of. Oh. Oh no! I'm thinking the night of. No, the night shift is a medical show. Right, 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 right. Yes. I got it wrong. Got it wrong. Yes. Um. Of. What else? Of course, Nashville. Uh, Nashville is really because that's a lot of fun. Yeah. And it's sort of. Uh, and that was the first episode of television. I yeah. Directed. I that remember was that three it was three years ago. I can't believe it was three years ago. I know. And when you work with the big stars of the show. Mm -hmm. And they have a different director all the time, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. How do they usually react? How did it, how is it, is it usually harder? Uh, or I always find the more successful somebody is, the easier they are to work with. Mm. Do you find that? Um, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I'm, and certainly I'm speaking as an actor now, you know, uh, uh, having done ER for so many years and having all those different directors. Oh yeah. You know, when a new director comes onto the set, it it's just natural for actors who've been on a television show for a while and who know each other and and have directors that they know and like, you know, when a new director comes on, everybody's a little wary. You know. Really? Oh yeah. They don't go, oh, this, this is gonna be great. Who's this person? What's she like? You know, can she and I think the actor's main concern is can she talk to us? Um. Because a lot of directors come through and they can set the camera. They know how to tell them, you know, the crew what kind of lens they want. You know, they know how to work the crew. But they forget about the actors. But they can't talk to the actors. 
So <clears throat> I notice a lot of casts. Do you are, tell people you're an actress also when you come on? You um, say, hey, yeah. Sure. I mean, they, and a lot of times they already know. But, right. you know, they're still, they don't know. They don't know me. They don't know how it's going to work out. And, you know, it. it I, so I allow them their space and I just do my thing. And then <clears throat> eventually they figure out, first of all, I know what I'm doing as a director. And second of all, I can actually talk to them. Which really is uh, incredible help. I yes. find, you know what my favorite thing is? Is when an, a director comes over and whispers something into my ear. Aww. And you know why? It's not just because it, I like the intimacy of it. I don't want the other actor to know what you're telling me. Right. Because I don't want them to think, oh, Lily's telling him to do it faster and make it more intense. So I'll do that too. <laughs> or I'll be reacting to it before I know what's happening. Oh. You know, uh... I, I often do that, I'll like very quietly. And also, I think it's kind of rude. We had a lot of directors who just sort of shout from the other. I mean, it's one thing, and I've certainly done that myself, but it'll be a simple direction. Right, if it's something, hey, you're, you like, need to move over just a little. You're... When you come in the door, come to the left. I mean, right. I can shout that across the room. That's... But I'm not going to shout across the room. This time, have a little, you know, be angry. I want you to. Seem angrier. Yeah, this you know, is more let's tense. Figure out, yeah, let's figure out how to do that. Yeah, I'm not gonna shout that. Hey, way. you didn't do it angry <laughs> enough. Everybody was looking. <laughs> right, you don't want to do that. So let's say hello to a couple friends here. Okay. Uh, Catherine Mendez, uh, Ryan. I'm saying it oh, wrong. Oh, Hamamora, that's Hama my Mora. niece. Oh, hello, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. David Hagel, Christopher Hill. Hey, hello, everybody. And we've got a lot of people watching. Uh, we've got Michael Hennessy, Larry Scott, Cat Simmons. Will, uh, uh, I'm saying it, I'm not going to say it wrong, James McHorder uh, and, and Joe Searcy, thank you all for listening in. Uh, for those of you who love the show, it will be on iTunes, or if you're listening right now, it's on iTunes, or some other of the uh, other places where you can ha listen to podcasts in the next couple weeks. Um, so tell me about working on your first feature film. That was really exciting. It, just, it was. Just the idea to raise, how did you raise the money first? Um, I just had a couple of angels. I mean, it was ultra low budget. Right. Very guerrilla filmmaking. Was it under a hundred thousand? I'm guessing. It was uh, under two hundred thousand. Oh wow! So you did well. Yes, I mean we had to pay for um, <clears throat> a couple of locations. Um, you know, but we stole. Oh, a yeah, lot so of shots. I, so did I when you I did my web series. I, sure. This apartment has been used so many times for so many <laughs> different things. I, I, I finally said I cannot have any. And people have also, friends have come here and filmed. Oh, really? So I, there's a film I did, Dirty, and they used my dining room. And, uh, mm. and I was in that film. <laughs> 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 this room is not very usable. Okay. But the rest of the apartment is because there's too All many right. pictures of me on the wall. This is, you're in my home office. And, uh, oh, I forgot to say, and I, I'd like to thank the Academy. This <laughs> This is, for, this is the sweetest thing. My uh, One of the kids that I mentor, Robbie uh, Carlisle, did this for me. He's his best mentor ever, and he had this made. Aww. And I thought that was so cool. So I always keep it here when I do the podcast. Hey, look, our friend Terry's listening. I'm listening to my older lesbian seagull. <laughs> <laughs> no, sis. Lily's old lesbian seagull. You we were, were in a play, were you Terry and I. Lesbians? Uh, I was, but Terry was not. But we were both seagulls. We were sitting in a nest. It was a, it was a, it was a, a play at Celebration. Oh, okay. And Celebration it was, Theater. Yes. Here and in it, West Hollywood, for those of you listening or not around. And uh, it was a, it was sort of like four, five, maybe five or six little, little uh, short plays, um, based on some real scientific evidence that. Uh, seagulls um, can be homosexual or lesbian. Why don't I know this? And so uh, they were all, so they told six playwrights, "Here's the premise." No, I think I saw this play. Here's the premise. Go write a little short play. So we presented like I think it was like five or six of them, and then one of them, Terry and I, were two two seagulls, and they. We had these beautiful costumes. We were sitting in our nest, and I can't remember if, you know, I don't really remember what <laughs> happened, but either either Terry decided he didn't want to be my husband or I decided I didn't want to be his wife because we were, we were both gay. I so, love that. Yeah. It just, or this is just not going to work out. Or this is just not going to work out. <laughs> yes. 
Oh gosh. Yeah. So, so, so tell me about your film. Oh, and yes. you, did you write the film? I wrote the film. I produced it. I uh, directed it. It's called Model Minority. It's on Amazon now. It was. It went through. So a if you're on Amazon minority. Prime, you can watch it. Model yes. min, uh, my, uh, Model. Model minor, minority. Minority. Yes. Model minority. Say that five, six times. <laughs> really fast. Um, it's about a half Japanese American, half Caucasian uh, teenage girl who falls in with the wrong crowd and starts on this path of, of uh, you know, going down the wrong crowd, with the wrong, going out with the wrong crowd. Drinking and drugs and that kind of thing? Uh, yeah. Now your husband is, is, is not Japanese, right? No, he's Jewish. Jewish, so you're in this, you're, so this is part of from your own experience. Uh, not really. Um, this is about a teenage girl and her dealing with her but still having alcoholic drug addict parents. And, and what you made know. you want to write that? <laughs> Um, I, I actually, well, first of all, I had heard a lot of stories, um, about young teenage Japanese American kids who were getting into trouble. And, you know, Asian people are called the model minority because we're smart. Oh, right, right. And the Asian A. I've always Asian heard a? that. I was in a support group with a, uh, an Asian gal who said, you know, there's this thing called the Asian A. And I think it was, uh, more, she was Chinese. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a Chinese thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, oh, that's cool. So it's the same thing as in being in... Well, because people assume, you know, Asian people are, are the model minority. Right. And, and The good kids. Right. So, um, you know, they don't get in trouble. They do well in school. You mm -hmm. know, they become lawyers and doctors and they're model citizens. But the truth is that they're, you know, we're people. And some people... Uh, you know, get in trouble. Some people fall into drugs and alcohol. Some people, you know, can't keep it together. And um, it, it was really based on a story I heard about this young girl. She was an actress. And she was 16, and she'd gotten this gig on a show. And one day she didn't show up for work. Really? So they sent the PAs out to look for her, and... They wow. found out that she had been killed in a drive-by with her drug dealer boyfriend. Oh, man. So when I heard this story, I was like, okay, this is... I mean, and also, uh, my short film, The Shangri-La Cafe, had been like the short in front of a feature at a film festival. Um, and it was a feature called When You're Smiling. It was a documentary about this woman's family and her parents had been in the Japanese internment camps during World War II. Mm. And they came out and they didn't want to talk about it, which is very similar to um, the Holocaust victims. Well, the Jews, my father was in the Holocaust, not the camps, but the ghettos and the farms and the placement camps and all the things. And, you know, the Jews have a thing called never forget. Mm. So we do nothing but talk about it. <laughs> Well, the and Japanese Americans were the very opposite. Different. Yeah, very different. They were like, they were like, there's a they beautiful don't want to film that Alan anything. Parker made uh, about that. Yes. called um, "Come See the Paradise." Come see the paradise yes. with, and you're going to pronounce her name better than I will. Tamlin Tamita. Yeah, who yes. was in the, the Joy Luck Club? Who's mm -hmm. just a wonderful actress. She's yes. on the show now, I think. Yes. And she's just. Yes. And I thought. You know, and a lovely, lovely person. Is she? Yes. And I, I thought to myself, this woman's got to be a big star Aww. for this movie. And she certainly did continue to work mm -hmm. and have a career, but yes. didn't have the... Uh, it shows... You know, I'm a big proponent of making that change in life, mm -hmm. as you probably know, mm -hmm. is the idea of researching and finding out how do we move people to the next level. Mm -hmm. And I think the black community and the Latin community and the gay community have really made strides, and now it's time for the Asian community, I think, to start doing that. I was working right. with, a, I think <laughs> so, I was talking with Ken Jeong um, Saturday mm -hmm. night because we worked together at the Laugh Factory, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, he was say, talking about working on The Hangover. Mm. And that movie changed his whole yes. entire life. He was just a comedian in clubs, and mm -hmm. he was a doctor working at yes. Kaiser Permanente. Right. And he quit being a doctor to be yeah. a comedian and an actor, which mm -hmm. is almost sacrilegious in any family. Yes. I mean, I think uh, my mother. In any family. Oh, I would think my mother would kill herself in the middle <laughs> of the street, and my father would stab me with a fork if I even had the intelligence <laughs> to be a doctor. But I'm this close to special needs, and. Uh, you know, he was talking about 
the idea of going in and working within the mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe in. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in saying, no, I don't want to take that part mm -hmm. because it's too this or too that. Oh, no, I agree with that. I believe go in and say, hey, you know, I don't have to wear a kimono in this. Oh, and I've, and I've done that. So have I. I. Yeah. Not the kimono, but the, <laughs> the scarf. You know, I remember hey. my first job, they said, would you like, could you wear a scarf? I said, yeah, if I were Thurston Howell. <laughs> It was for 1972, 62, you know. Yeah, right. That, yeah, but we don't do that anymore. So I think part of that is that it's important for Asian Americans to tell our stories. And and so what I was saying about when you're smiling is that it was, it was a documentary about her parents who had gone to the Japanese internment camps and came oh. out and didn't, didn't want to talk about it. So what happened was, um, they sort of passed on this. Um, I wouldn't call it disease, but you know this incredible dysfunction. It's, it's a withholdingness. It's a way of learning how to teach, be your life, so you don't get to be you. Right. So and they you, they and pass, you spend your life. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody who has had that kind of thing happen, it's I, I used to call it the post its that are left on you. Yeah. I'm the kid. The father was in the Holocaust. Right, hey, right. I'm a kid that was beat up as a kid. Hey, I'm a kid that. Mother had, you know, a lot of husbands. I'm, you know, and you right. you have all these stories attached to you. And that's exactly what this documentary was about. Mm -hmm. Was about her, I think you I know, saw her uh, when you're smiling. Yeah, I think I saw. Oh, okay. So it, basically, it was about this. her and her her siblings, and one of them went to jail. One of them was a an alcoholic, drug addict. I mean, they all had a lot of dysfunction, even though on the outside they they looked like a model family their parents had passed on all this sort of dif dysfunction to them. So, but when I saw this film, I thought, um, what happens to the next generation after that? Because Janice, is, uh, Janice Tanaka is the filmmaker. And, you know, for her, she told this story because then you see what, why, you know, you see that her I'm parents went with through the this. I'm fascinated with why. Me too. Yeah. So you see the why. But then I thought, what about their kids? Now you don't see the why anymore. You just see the the the, the grown ups with the dysfunction having these kids, and now the kids, you know, it doesn't just go away by itself. Mm -hmm. The kids get this second generation dysfunction, and what happens to them? So it was both those things. It was Janice's film. And I've seen this, your film, and, this story. and it's, I'm not going to go, it's only not for the show, but I, <laughs> just to, for people to talk about it, but I loved your film. Oh, thank you. I really, really loved it. And I think that, you know, biracial people are the future, yes. mostly, because it's, it's, you know, it's just the way it is. Right. And it's really interesting, is now we're seeing biracial people in commercials, mm -hmm. and I was talking to a friend about Lady Bird, the film, oh. and one of the kids in the film, I think they have an Hispanic child or an Asian child, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. It's funny that I can't even remember. Mm -hmm. Because it didn't really matter. And what right. was really interesting is they never talked about it except for once when the daughter says, hey, you're not going to use the race thing to get into this. <laughs> you know, you're just not going to do that. Right. And it, it showed something about the parents, the idea that they adopted a child and that they brought the child's girlfriend in the, into the mm -hmm. film and she stayed into the house. It showed something about the parent without having to say it. Right. And that's my favorite thing in a movie or a TV show, when someone doesn't nail something on the head. Right. You know, when we're um, able to communicate something in a more real way. Because right. you don't walk in, hi, this is my Asian friend, Lily. <laughs> you know, people don't do that, you know. Right. Uh, someone said to me when we had... Uh, my first guest on the show was uh, Selene Luna, mm -hmm. who's Mexican, but which mm -hmm. we really didn't talk about until Coco, because she's in that big film Coco, mm -hmm. and then and she's a little person, so we didn't really. And I forgot, totally forgot to bring it up until the end. And we were talking about stuff, so it's just because she's my friend Selene. So mm -hmm. we, it, it seems to have become a part of our um, our lives now in such a neat way, and I'm so glad. It makes me so happy. Me too. You know? uh, we were just watching television last night and. It's just amazing how many commercials have interracial couples and there's no mention of it. You just see... It used the, to be, yeah. Oh, but now it's just like you see the kid and the dad and then you see the mom at the dinner table and it's like, oh, yeah. That's for us what, older folks, we... we that's we, what life's like. Yeah. I remember the only time you'd see an Asian person in a, in a commercial when I was a kid, it, it would be San Francisco rice <laughs> I mean, that would be it, you know, or yes. something weird like that. Or, you know... Uh, you just wouldn't see people when I was growing up in the 70s and, and 
you just didn't see it. And I think that's why I asked so many questions about it because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also still, I think the next thing is, is that's why I love the movie The Shape of Water so much. Oh. It's all about character actors. Yes. It's all about falling in love. Mm -hmm. And everybody's not perfect. Right. And I do believe that in life, of what we find attractive, we are sort of told. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, 200 years ago, if you were fatter, mm -hmm. you would be considered rich because yes. you had food to eat. Right. And it was more attractive. Mm -hmm. And if you, and also it would mean you were healthy mm -hmm. because a lot of people died because they were too thin. Right. And now you see these people on these shows who are stick thin mm -hmm. and it really is a very difficult um, uh, thing to have in your life and all these eating disorders for these young girls. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really cool that that's starting to change. I saw Project Runway and all the models last oh, yeah. year were right. all different sizes. Mm -hmm. It, it was, was just sort of amazing. It was great. Especially in that industry. Yes. You know. Now, do you want to direct another film? I do. I'm attached to a couple of films right now. Oh, good. <laughs> One is called Lost and Found. It's written by... Oh, my God. I was in a movie called Lost and Found. Oh, you were? Yeah. There's um, a lot of movies called Lost and Found. Oh, okay. Well, if this one... That but talk. this one's written by Iris Yamashita. Uh -huh. um, she was nominated for an Academy Award for Letters from Iwo Jima. Yes. What did she, um, she wrote it? Yes. Oh, she wow. wrote this film. Man. Uh, Jimmy Tsai is uh, the producer. And uh, and I'm, uh, it's about children who remember past lives. And so it's sort of a sixth sense. I was, that's immediately feeling. that came to my mind. Right. It's a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful film. Wow. So you're attached to this. I'm this attached is to that. really cool. And then I'm also uh, working with uh, Diane Kwan, who's a producer. She's got a film that just uh, made a big splash at Sundance. Which um, one? Um, you're going to ask me for oh. the title and I can't remember now. Oh. Uh, Mind, Mind the Gap. That's what it's oh, called. Oh yes, I read Mind about the Gap. that. Um, and she bought the rights to a wonderful novel called Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. And it's about... Oh, a, I love that title. In, in World War II, a young J Chinese American boy uh, falls in love with a little Japanese American girl. And then she and her family are taken off to the internment camps. So it's a Romeo and Juliet tale. I mm. won't tell you the end, but it's a happy ending. Because mm. it starts from today and flashes back to then and then flashes back to today. Uh -huh. um, but George Takei is also attached. Such a nice man. And um, I dig him. I've known him for years and he let us use his name. Did he? When we started the LGBT committee at Screen Actors Guild after uh -huh. uh, 13 years ago. He was a very good friend of, uh, he still lives at Duncan Crabtree, Ireland, oh. who's the uh, legal, oh, yes. legal counsel yes. at SAG after, and he let I've us I've actually spoken name. to Duncan. Yeah, he's a great guy he's too. A, he was a great Just guy. a great guy too. Oh, wow. And um, I just got nominated for a DGA award. I would, that's my next thing. <laughs> I could not, I, it's not that I couldn't believe it, I was like, is that Lily? No, I can't believe it. I couldn't believe it. How? So tell us what episode. Tell it's, us everything. Uh, well, it's a show called Just Add Magic. And Which has Dee Wallace in it. Dee Wallace, who yes. I adore. Oh, Who's we had a, a great time. Oh, really? Yeah, I love her. Tell her I, said I think it's so funny. We have, so, other than our other friend, group I know, of friends. I know, we have. We have other group of friends that we're very close to. But I thought it's amazing how much we have in common I know. people that we didn't even know because when I, know. I met you I didn't know you were even an actress or a director no well, you either yeah so now we know yeah yeah um let's see oh yes uh so it's, it's called... my episode's called just add meddling and um the dj awards are this saturday but you know uh, I like to say I have a twenty percent chance of winning because there's five of us up. For it this doesn't even. Panic. It does matter, but it doesn't no, matter. No, I swear wow. to God, it doesn't it's matter. I think it's. It doesn't matter. I'm just so honored to be, and you know, people always say that I'm really honored to be, but this is my brand new profession, and mm -hmm. I'm. I've Three been, years into it, already <laughs> a, a DJ for a nom DJ award. Did you, did you know you were put up for the nomination? Well, because you have to. Because for those at to, home don't know right. it, in the Television Academy. I got a call from the closer yes, people right. who told me you have to put yourself up. Yes, and, and everybody... we used to do that on ER. They encouraged us to join yes. the Television Academy, and then every year they would say, um, "So you get one free pass to like submit yourself for an Emmy." Right. And and ER would say, "Submit yourself for an Emmy, even if you don't think you're going to get it." Because what happens is then the people in the Academy scroll through the names and go, "Oh, Lily Mari 
Perrier, ER, you know, and then they It's see, also about they publicity. It's a right. free publicity They thing. see you're working, they see the show, whatever. So for 15 seasons, I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so once I got the DGA, I started doing that again because you get one freebie. So I was like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll do it. What made you choose this show and not... A- well, I I didn't, I, I wasn't even, I was, I was in the middle of, of uh, directing NCIS LA when the nomination period came up. And I was like, oh, I got to do that. Oh, I got to do that. I'm so busy. And then both Netflix and NBC contacted me about two episodes that I was working on, Chicago PD and Just Said Magic. And they said, we'll fill out the form. We'll send the DVDs in. You just have to sign your name and write your DGA number. And I was like, okay, great. That's easy, Because yeah. I'm kind of busy. Wow. So I did it, and I didn't think about it. Because Cause it's good for them, too. It's great for them. Because in, sa- in that same fashion, people Just Said Magic, where can folks watch it? Uh, Netflix. It's a Netflix show, okay. Netflix. Or, well, no, sorry, sorry. It's Amazon. Amazon. And but, it's, it's um, also for I think kids, you can, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think you can get it on Amazon Prime. So for those of you who have kids, it's a great show to watch. Yes. And you have Dee Wallace, the mom from E.T., plays the grandmother on the it's show. It's a great show. Yeah. It's a great show. But this is sort of out of your wheelhouse of what you've been directing. Well, you know what? I wanted to direct it. Why I wanted to direct it is because there's visual effects involved. Right. And it also, I mean, it's not your typical kids show. It, it you know, the the director producer on the show is Joe Nussbaum, and he's a big fan of Steven Spielberg's, and so it sort of has that feel of a Goonies or E.T., um, and that's why Dee Wallace is in it. You know, it's that sort of this story, and it just happens to be G-rated. Um, and then there's visual effects. These girls get this cookbook and they make a recipe. And but the show isn't like, and I hate to say this, it isn't like some of the Nickelodeon shows. It's real and the people aren't on the edge of, uh, you know. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. Re- the acting is more real on the show. Oh, it's they, great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. So um, so I, I wasn't even thinking about it. And then I went to edit NCIS LA and I wasn't looking at my phone because I was working all day. So you didn't get up early or anything? No, you know, I'm yeah. not going to get nominated for this. And I didn't even know that was the day of the, the announcements. Oh. So I get in the elevator. I'm like, thank you all. It was my last day. Thanks so much. Blah, blah, blah. You know, hug everybody. Get in the elevator, pull out my phone. And it's like, oh my God, my phone blew up. What happened? I had like 400 messages. So I... I thought, all right, I'll start with my emails. So I pressed email, and my first email came up, and it was from Leslie Linka Glatter. And the subject line said, bravo, with a thousand exclamation points. So I opened it, and it said, I'm so, so, so proud of you. Congratulations. A thousand emojis. Love, Leslie. But I was like, yeah, what the hell? What? <laughs> yes, you had no idea. So then I started opening all my texts and emails, and I saw what it was. And by the time my elevator got to the bottom floor, I was like shaking so hard I had to sit in the lobby <laughs> because I couldn't walk to my car. And then I called my husband, um, and then I did called he know? Him. No, he didn't know anything. We were both like, what? <laughs> wow. So now you're in this group. You know, I'm in, once, a, I'm once in you, a group of people that get nominated for things, and once you get in, you're in. Well, I think so. Do you want to? Do you want to do your own show? Is, would you? Do I you want to stay in what, an episode of TV, or do you want to move over to features, or do you um, want to do both? I want to do both. Yeah. I want to go back and forth. And you still want to act too. And I, you know, the because I want to make sure that people know that just because someone moves into something else, right? It isn't like when we were kids. If you even when oh, I no. started doing acting, when I started doing comedy, they went, "Oh, are you sure you want to be considered a serious actor right. now?" You know, people couldn't see you doing. You two couldn't things. do commercials. You couldn't do television. You couldn't do even movies. doing this podcast. Doing that, this is considered. You know, you're like a desperation boulevard. Oh, you have to do something else. Wow. It was like that very much. You know, you stuck to your one thing and you did that great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people do ask me, oh, so you're not acting anymore. It's like, mm, no. I would love to. <laughs> right. But I, but I, the gift I get is that I get to be pickier. Oh, lovely. About what I want to do. So you don't have to be, you know, what are the, you know, uh, Asian mother number one. Yeah. Right. And I don't have to be gay dude number three. <laughs> or annoying Jew. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But it's so lovely. This Jason, is... I thought I was just going to come on and you would be funny and I'd laugh for an hour. Did you? Yeah. No, I'm more yeah. serious. Am yeah. I more serious? Yeah. No, you're funny too. I'm, I'm I mean, very you're interested. You're just like you are. Am I? I'm always yeah. very interested 
in how one gets to where one goes. Mm. It, that's, that's why I started doing I think if you're not interested, then you don't do this kind of show. And that's what I started doing when I started doing this type of show around uh, seven years ago. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think for me anyway, it, I never felt like I was one thing because I never was one thing. I started as a dancer, mm. a ballet dancer. And I was in a little company, and 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 then I thought, well, if I want to be a dancer, I'm going to have to learn how to sing so I can dance. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to dance and sing, I probably need to learn how to act in order to dance and sing and act. And so I was a dancer, singer, actor for a really long time. So you did musicals. I did musicals. My first musical was uh, the movie Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Oh, really? With uh, Dolly Parton and Bert You were Reynolds. in that movie? I was in that oh, movie. Oh, my God. Now when you watch it, you'll be like, oh... There she is. Um, wow. And then at a certain point, you know, dance was like an athlete. You, I, you, know, you I, can't, I, I, you just, can't wait, wait, dance. I, we can't get past this so quickly. All right, okay. I love Burt Reynolds. I mean, I was, when I was a kid, he was just, I was so attracted to him. Oh, wow. Because he was sexy and charming and funny and yeah. just everything you wanted to be. Oh, yeah. You know, if you could be a guy, that's who you would want to be. I mean, sure. He was just the ultimate leading man. I always think he's... He a, was a huge movie star. Oh, my world. God, the biggest. I can't believe he doesn't get... He's not getting any of the... He's now in his 80s, and he's... I think he's probably 80. Is he? I think so. And he's not getting the... Someone should... He should be getting, you know, Lifetime Achievement Awards. Oh, this he is should. a guy that just... He was a he was the biggest movie star in the world. My favorite performance, I think, of his was probably uh, the film that Alan J. Capula wrote called "Starting Over." Oh, that, uh, that was Alan great. J. Capula directed rather, and Jim J. Brook Jim J. Uh, 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 Brooks directed, mm. and uh, who later went on to do *Terms yes. of Endearment* and broadcast news and everything, and he was so. That's uh, Jill Clayburgh. Jill Clayburgh, oh, yeah. the late Jay Clayburgh, and, and Candace Bergen, mm -hmm. which is the movie that changed her whole career, made her funny. Yeah. When she played his wife that wanted to be a singer, couldn't yeah. say. <laughs> and I just, I always adore Jill Clayburgh. Me too. Oh my God, she since passed us. God bless her. Oh, uh, and I just loved him. What was it like working with uh, Bert before I go into a whole thing? Um, uh, Bert was great. I mean, there was one point we were all like. Why is Bert so grouchy? And Dolly said, "Well, y'all know, you know, he just broke up with Sally, so Aww. and he, you know, he he ain't feeling so well, so y'all gotta, y'all gotta, you know, give him a little break." So that's Sally Field for you guys. Who know. <laughs> and he talks about her in his book, Aww. and he has a whole chapter, and he says that she's the one that got away. Yeah, and he and all, you could tell. Yeah, and he that he made the, he made a big mistake. You know, it's interesting because I thought, you know, he had dated all these interesting women like, mm -hmm. um, you know, Judy Karn, who was sort of yeah. interesting and Dinah Shore, who was yeah. really interesting and Sally and all these off the track. And then he married Lonnie Anderson, which was so bizarre because she didn't seem like an off the track kind of gal. Mm -hmm. She seemed more like a more a, on the track, on the track kind of Hollywood glamour puss. And my friend Terry works with her on a show called. Um, that he oh, produces, I'm sure he yeah. yeah, called um, oh God, uh, my sister's so gay, oh. and they're starting a new season, and Lonnie's going to star in it okay. again. Yeah, yeah. But I always got the feeling she was. I mean, I don't know her personally, but I always got the feeling she, she was much more level-headed than, than we would have expected. Oh her yeah, to be. you. Can, she was a mom, and yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think she just understood how to play the game and sure. use what she had. In those days, sure. women had to use what they have, which is really which a shame. They still kind of do. But do you, you know. did you start directing because you felt that it was drying up acting wise for you, or that you weren't getting the parts you wanted to get? I mean, I'm always trying to reinvent myself. I'm constantly trying I mean, to I figure think... out where I am at this age. You know what right. I mean? When I hit, you know, thirty. When I hit forty. When I hit fifty. You know mm -hmm. how this age of how you deal with that. I mean, it's really, because you're, and also, you're a different person. You're not the same. You don't carry yourself the same mm -hmm. way when you get older. Um, I, I think it was less of that for me, and just, first of all, it was something that was available to me, this, you know, enormous, I, I called it my college of, of filmmaking. Of getting to so being on ER and it's really, and you know yeah. the thing with that was uh, I I had sense. all my friends you know once I started shadowing and being interested in directing 
I could ask my friends. You know, it wasn't like I was shadowing on a show that I didn't know anyone. I could say, what does this crane do? What what lens is that? You know, what is, say to the sound guys, what do you call this? What what are you doing here? Watch what the, you know, what, watch what the prop people were doing. Watch what prosthetics the makeup people were doing. I was always really interested in everything that was happening. Talk to the art directors and the production designer, you know, just... I was able to ask them questions that I wouldn't have been able to do on it on any other. Because you were there for so long, you were right? So and they were my friends, right? So I could ask them. And you. And then I was also a writer, and that was the other thing. I I had been a writer through college, and then started getting acting work, and thought, okay, well, bloom where you're planted. So I started wow. acting, but I continued to write. Mm. And then I, at a certain point, I thought, you know, no one's going to produce these films but me right so I thought all right I I'll learn how to direct so I can direct these things that I'm writing these stories yeah right because I felt like I had stories to tell and Elizabeth Banks had a great it was a great article about her recently and she talks about when she got to Hollywood that um that the kinds of projects that she thought she'd be doing and the kinds of roles she thought she'd be playing didn't exist and that she felt underused and so I thought wow that's a great way to put it you know I mean I came here thinking I was going to be Shirley MacLaine or Debbie Reynolds oh wow you know I can see that though and when I got here Best Little Horror House was like one of the last musicals to be made for like the next 20 years so studio musicals yeah. studio musicals yeah 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 Definitely. But I encourage you to cast yourself. I really do. And people say, oh, don't do that. It doesn't have to be that. I encourage you to do that. And the reason is, I look at Rob Reiner the mm-hmm. most, and he really uh, became a very successful character actor, yes. as it did his father, who's also yes. a director, by directing. And mm-hmm. I think people wanted to work with him because they wanted to work with him as a director. And I don't right. think there's anything wrong with that. And for one reason, one reason only, because they're talented. Right. And you're talented. Oh, thank you. And I think that's, you know, people say, oh, don't, you know. For me, you know, I directed out of necessity. I've only directed two small things. Oh, exactly. But um, I re- I like directing actors. Oh, I, I love directing. I, that's my favorite part. Mm-hmm. And I love creating the mood of the film and working with the cinematographer. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I have the, I don't, ha- I don't have the... Uh, gift of being on a show for that long to be able to go to school basically while you were actually getting paid and acting Mm -hmm. and I think that you know for me I always think on the set I so love being an actor I so love figuring out how I fit into this as a as a character actor and I love being a supporting player Mm -hmm. I love that Mm -hmm. because how do I help tell this story Mm -hmm. through the lead actor you Mm -hmm. know I really remember where I am Mm -hmm. all the tricks of of staying in the shot. <laughs> yes. You know? Yes. And people don't, and learning your job and also creating, basically, you are the makeup of the show. You are the, you're the pieces of it. Oh, sure. And Absolutely. It's re- and I love it. I love doing Absolutely. that. I don't have to be the leading player to have a, to, you know, and I very rarely have ever been. And it doesn't, it's not my goal. And uh, I always feel like, you know, that when you reach over 40, you become who you really are. Mm hmm. And you start to be able to be the best you. Right. And uh, I feel the same way underused. I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, ready to do that. And you just wonder. So if anybody out there has any ideas, please feel free to <laughs> send them in. I'm always open to uh, that. You know, I think the idea of, of being able to do... Jessica Lang said something sort of when her career was going down before, uh, you know, not getting, getting supporting roles in films mm-hmm. and not leads when... Uh, before Ryan Murphy started using her so incredibly well. Yes. You know, she said, I'm at the best part of my life. I'm, I'm the best me now. And she was mm-hmm. in her 40s mm-hmm. to play, to do stuff. Right. You know, she was starting to hit 50. And she did something really interesting. She was on Broadway in Streetcar Named Desire and realized that, that she needed to learn how to be a stage actress more. And then went on to work in, as Mary Ty, uh, Tyrone in Long Day's Journey into the Night and mm-hmm. really just became this powerhouse. Not that she wasn't great in that, but mm-hmm. she, couldn't, she, was, she couldn't be heard. 
And there's all sorts of things to learn about voice to right. walking on the stage. Right. I mean, that's where I started, was yeah. theater. And I loved it. I mean, mm. I, I, uh, to me, it feels like theater is the actor's medium. Because once the director and you know the choreographer and everyone has, has rehearsed with you, you are telling the story every night. And it's, but you have to stay within these parameters. See, I feel differently about that. You do? Yeah, because I think on a set, you can say to me, hey, let's do this another way. Mm. And I can do that another way. But in a play, the playwright is God. Mm. And they want you, you know, I was recently in Larry Moss's master class. Oh. Thank you, Larry. Who really, I'm not a stage actor. I've done a lot of stage, mm. but I don't consider myself a stage actor. More, mm. My experience is more in film and television. And I think that... Um, but from stand-up, I have an incredible amount of presence on stage. Yeah, sure. So it's a, you know, from that. But I think that um, in film, you can keep getting it better and changing it and going, oh, this isn't working. But in a stage thing, people get very, I mean, how many times have you seen a play and then you see the play again with another company and they're almost the same kind of person mm -hmm. rather than doing something new and different? Mm. See, I'm always new and different. Mm. I love new and different. I, I like the experience of standing on the stage and telling this whole new room full of people a story, which is probably the same thrill you get oh, from stand-up. Saturday night I was doing a show with Dane Cook and Ken Jong and Jay Davis hosted the show, and it was just one of those shows where they just lifted us up oh. off the stage. And I haven't had one of those shows in a long time since Trump became president. Sort of the audiences have changed. There's oh, a certain... Wow anger in people there's a certain fight and a certain tightness mm -hmm. that i'm feeling people are anxiety written they're preoccupied yes. and it's a different not the shows haven't been good but mm -hmm. it's different and this one just sort of lifted off the page oh nice yeah and i'm remembering the power of it mm -hmm. i don't always remember that because it's been so many years mm -hmm. it's just you wait for that moment have you had that moment as an actor, what film or what television show gave you that moment? Uh, you I, mean, like I, I think I've, I've electric. You just I like, felt that more on stage than I do. You know, with film and television, you're you as know, an actor. You know, okay. as an actor, you're in a room full of you know, teamsters eating donuts. You're not really you know, you are engaged with the camera, but there isn't that feeling you have when you're in a theater. And you can feel the vibration of the the audience, who's the other character in the play. And if the if, if the other character in the play is tired because it's Friday night, you have to sort of drag them along. But if it's Saturday night and they're all excited, you know, or they're drunk or whatever, you know, mm. you sort of you sort See, of see. It's so funny because I I've, I've worked in clubs so long that I'm sick of the people doing that. <laughs> I'm sick of them control. And I think when you do a film or television show. You have, there's this intimacy where you and I are this close, mm. you know, and it's, and now we're, because of this, for you guys don't realize it doesn't look there, but we've been so close to each other <laughs> for so long, I almost want to kiss her. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's so, uh, I love that intimacy because mm. I've, you know, I've been on stage for mm -hmm. so many mm -hmm. years doing this mm -hmm. and you don't get a choice. And if you don't make people laugh, mm -hmm. they're not going to ask you back. Right. You know, it's not like you're doing someone else's. I've done plays that are mm -hmm. wonderful. I worked, mm -hmm. did the wonderful Susan Rubin. I, she directed, uh, she wrote a play rather uh, called, um, oh, where is it? Uh, uh, there it is on the wall, um, Above the Line. Wonderful play. I had such a great experience working Aww. with her in the lovely acting office at the lovely Denise Dows. And I, so for me, it's more than the venue. It's mm. the person, it's the people. Mm. I almost don't care if it's a play, a film, a TV show, a web series, what it is. It's about that, you know, when people lift you up. Mm -hmm. Have you felt that, like when you were doing your film, did you feel that or was it just so crazy because of the limitations? Oh, no. I, you know, I, there was the craziness, but then once you're sitting in front of the monitor and you're watching these actors and, you know, I just assembled a, a really great group of actors some of them I knew from ER you know I just had to ha I knew I, I had love to have that. I just love I knew that. I had to so have you're, really but great the, actors. The, the, the first group or the second group the second group right I had Laura Innes I oh, had yeah second group <laughs> she, oh, oh you mean she had her act in the film yes, yes I had yes, her act yes, in yes. the film oh I remember I saw it yes yes yes, yes. um 
I love that, her. It's just that that excitement of watching, like for instance, in this last episode of of Nashville, I'd work with horses. And talk about unpredictable, oh, you know, yeah. I mean, I had to get them to do certain things and it was scripted that um, this girl, it's a equine therapy session and this young Say girl. Say that again, what is that? Equine therapy. So I don't know what that is. It's therapy where they use horses to... Oh, it's sort of like a dog. Uh, uh, the people say they have to have this dog. This is the these rest. What do you call these emotional dogs? Is that kind uh, of thing? No, it's at, it's they're actual therapy sessions. And you, what you have to do is you have to convince the horses to do things. And it's really about communication and learning for these kids to learn communication. Oh, wow. So that must kids, have been really interesting and weird. It, it was. Different. So that's what this whole, this whole episode was about, was this equine therapy ranch. And there was a session with this young girl who had some problems and... She was trying to get this horse to do things, and she just broke down and sat down in the middle of the the, the mm. pen and started crying. And it was scripted that the horse would come over and sort of nudge her on the back. And, you know, of course, we tried a couple times, and the, the horse, horse was, was just in. not having it. And then finally, at one point, the horse, as if I told it what to do, <laughs> the horse came over... And like nudge the girl like this and nudge the girl like this and then just sort of like sat here and like 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 was affectionate with the girl and the girl like you know turned and 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 patted it and then it came around the other side and I was st I was there with the with the cinematographer you know we can't shout because right scare the horse well and also you don't want to record the sound of the director shouting in the background. So the two of us were like grabbing each other, watching the monitor going. <laughs> but you know, but the horse just didn't feel it. <laughs> and the horse, you know, just wasn't feeling it. She was the a moment. method horse. Yes, yes. So it's moments like that where you're telling a story and then just m magic happens. And just add magic. And just add magic. We'll end it with the show with that. Uh, best director for, uh, is it called Best Director for Children? It's Outstanding Directing. Outstanding Directing. Achievement. For That's what it's uh, the called. category is? This category is uh, Children's Children's programs. Programming. This is yeah. wonderful. This is absolutely wonderful. So I just want to say thank you so much, Lily, oh, for being on the show. thank you, James. And if people want to find you, where do they find you? Um, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm and you have on a website? Instagram, I have a website, lilymarie.net. Okay, and um, spell your last name again for me. M-A-R-I-Y-E. And if you can't... L-I-L-Y. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking over it so they can't say it. <laughs> say it again, Jesus Christ. L-I-L-Y, M-A-R-I-Y-E. So if you can't find her, just go to jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T, send me a message, or send a message on Facebook, and uh, thank you all so much, and until next time, take care. Thank you, Jason. That was amazing. Did I just... Goodbye, everybody.